would like to now introduce our first speaker, Samantha McHugh. Samantha McHugh is the flight test lead for the XQ-58A unmanned aerial vehicle designed and built by Kratos Defense and Sec Security Solutions. Samantha holds a bachelor's of science degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Illinois and a master's degree in engineering systems management from Texas A&M. During the first five years of her career, Samantha worked for NASA, UTC Aerospace, Simron, and Boeing, and focused on human space flight programs. In 2016, she joined 5D Systems as a systems engineer during the initial design phase of XQ-58A. Since 2016, she has served as the integration and test IPT lead and flight test director for the XQ-58A, as well as other Kratos unmanned vehicles. Outside of her engineering works, Samantha owns and manages two boutique fitness studios in Austin, Texas, actively participates in University of Illinois Aerospace Engineering Department Advisory Board, and loves any opportunity to travel and eat good food. Today, Samantha will be talking about a new way of doing business involving the XQ-58A and trends in the aerospace industry. All right. Thank you for the introduction. I apologize. My video is not working. It's, the, it's not stable enough, so I don't want you to look at my frozen face the whole time here. Um, I, uh, I did a little intro slide about me, which is going to be a very much repeated of what, what was just that. I wasn't sure what kind of an introduction there would be. I guess kind of the highlights are that I was born and raised in Illinois, um, went to school at Illinois and only moved to Texas when I started working after my um, undergrad degree, moved to Houston, Texas to work on manned space flight stuff and started working with Cimarron and, and was full-time contracted to work on the Boeing commercial crew program. From there, I actually transferred and started working for Boeing after a couple of years. And um, then after some time with Boeing, I, I really just found that the, the pace of the work and the, the level of responsibility that I was able to get at Boeing in such a big organization, it was really hard as a young, hungry, excited engineer um, at that time, at that program, um, for me to really have a meaningful impact. So I, I started looking for other opportunities and looked at smaller companies. And that's what led me to Austin, Texas, which is where I am located now. And I work for a company called 5D Systems. We're a small services company, and we focus primarily on unmanned aerial systems. So that can mean a lot of things. Obviously, the drones, you know, UAVs are making the news all the time now in all kinds of realms. But we do work on primarily unmanned tactical planes that have their own purpose for different Department of Defense branches. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I, I have been actively involved with the aerospace engineering department uh, since I graduated and I, I love Illinois. Illinois is so home to me. That's where all my family is. So I try to get back as often as possible. And uh, some of these programs and things that are listed on the right are the, the things I've been able to stay involved in and keep me connected to campus and to the department since I've graduated. Um, on the bottom right there is a, is a picture of me at one of our factories looking at a, a target drone, which a lot of people don't really know about, but a target drones are, are essentially drones that are used for target practice for manned aircraft. So pilots in fighter jet style planes or really anything, right? If they're doing any kind of practice, they want to have things that imitate other weapons that might be coming at them or they'd be running down. And so we build drones to imitate or simulate those kinds of things. And that is one of those, which is why it's bright orange, uh, because you want to be able to see it for trading purposes. So this was a few years ago, and this was in one of the factories out in California. So today is kind of an interesting discussion. It's um, not directly tied to space work. However, you know, it is definitely my passion, and it always has been. What I do now is certainly a little tangential to that, but um, the idea of unmanned, efficient vehicles to do as much as possible and continue to push the edge of you know, science and technology is something I'm passionate about, and that's something I still get to do at my current job. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is something called the XQ-58A, um, the Valkyrie drone, uh, it's something I've been working on for about the last five years. I apologize that some of these slides are, <laughs> they're a little bit cookie cutter, and the reason is there's only so much that is available for public release. So um, I took as much as I could, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and there's other things that I'd love to show pictures of, I just I wasn't allowed to. I'm actually going to skip kind of two slides ahead to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So down here on the bottom right is the 
XQ-58A aircraft to give you some scale for it, right? So it's about 30 feet long um, and a 27 foot wingspan. It puts it over here on the top left next to an F-16, which is, you know, something some people might have reference to how big that is, but it's a fairly large plane. Um, you know, when people think about drone aircraft, a lot of times they think about the quadcopters, you know, that people fly around in their backyard, or they think about small things that we fly. Uh, they really don't think about drones that are the size of manned aircraft, and those are very much becoming a reality now. Flipping back to the history of this plane, I work for, like I said, a small company named 5D Systems, but I've been contracted full-time um, since I started with them to work for Kratos, which is a company in, uh, that is based out of California. And um, they have been a target drone company for, for a long time and have began development of this aircraft in July of 2016. And I actually started in June of 2016. So I started my first you know week on the job was working on this platform. Um, the idea with this is that you're creating a drone that can do something that other drones do not. Um, and you're trying to create this sort of ability to have a runway independent, meaning you don't have to, you know, roll down a runway to take off and you don't have to land on a runway, but you can quickly support new payloads or new technologies that you want to try out in a more low cost sort of a way. Um, you know, one of the big problems that the military, military has right now is a lot of the big planes that everybody knows about and sees on the news, they cost a lot of money. And a lot of times those things are very, very old. And so in order to make a change, it takes thousands of engineers and lots of dollars to do so. But what everyone's kind of learning is maybe that's not the best way to do it. Um, and so this plane, this UAV, you know, the idea is how do you create something that is the right size that can deliver different kinds of payloads or maybe weapon systems if that's what you need in a quicker fashion than having to build this brand new, very expensive fighter jet, for example. And the obvious benefit is that you don't have a man in the cockpit. So you're not risking someone's life when you send this thing out to go on a mission somewhere. As this mentioned, we began development of this plane in July of 2016, and we flew our very first flight in March of 2019. So that's very fast by, um, I guess, you know, military government organization standards. I was with the program from the beginning and able to be the flight test director uh, for that March flight, and I have been for all the flights since. And it was very, very exciting. A couple key buzzwords in here I just want to point out is one main difference with this aircraft is that it is meant to be a long range, high speed and very maneuverable plane. So there are drones and we'll see this on the following pages that, you know, they go really, really, really high, but they go really slow. There are smaller drones that can go a little bit faster, but they have to stay lower. But the capability that this drone has is kind of far, kind of above and beyond of, of anything that we have operational right now. And to kind of give you a feel for that here on this next slide, you can see some different sort of unmanned aerial capabilities that have that exist and things you might have seen pictures of in the news. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's kind of talking about altitude. So let's say zero to 50,000 feet, which is kind of in the realm that we fly in the aircraft world. And on the bottom is airspeed, right? So from super slow guys all the way to Mach 1. There's a lot, right, in this very slow, lower end, um, but there's not much you know, the, as you start to get higher and faster. And that's kind of where this vehicle is positioned to be. It's a very interesting sort of concept because it, it doesn't have, you know, landing gear like some of these items do down here, um, which make them runway dependent. And, you know, that makes our operations sometimes more complicated. I'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a second. But it also provides us kind of an advantage because I mean, there's a lot of situations where, you know, runways have to go to manned aircraft or you don't have run enough runways to do all the things you want to do in sort of a mission scenario. And this drone is not reliant on that. We launch with rocket motors and we land under a parachute and landing airbag system. So it's a pretty cool concept. This kind of gives you a little bit of more of an idea of what that looks like. So from a overall perspective, this, this is a, an actual photo of one of our flights. Um, you can see that, you know, we're kind of on a, a launch rail. So there's a metal rail that, that kind of ends right back here. Um, and we strap basically two motors to either side of this plane, rocket motors. And in addition to having our engine, you know, at full throttle, essentially, we have these two rocket motors that are attached to the plane. Um, those stay with the plane until they completely burn off their solid rocket motors. Once they're done, they fall away and the plane continues to fly out. So for those of you that are interested in, in you know, like uh, any kind of rocket systems, whether it's, 
for aircraft or spacecraft or anything, you know, everyone knows those are pretty difficult systems to tune because once you start them, they, they don't stop, right? You're going to burn until all of your fuel or material, whatever it is, is gone. And so this is a particularly interesting problem because a lot of people who fly airplanes don't know anything about rockets. And this, this system kind of brings the two things together. Kratos as a whole, uh, interestingly enough, you know, a lot of the target drones do launch with, with Rados. We call them, those are the rocket motors. And so they have a lot of experience in this area. And so transitioning to a, a Rado powered takeoff for this plane was a fairly simple thing for Kratos to do. Other companies have tried it and, and it can get difficult because if you're not familiar with, you know, how you set the angle and the power and those kinds of things behind it, uh, you can have a really bad day if, if you're not, if you don't have it going the right direction. That's the takeoff. Um, when it's flying, it's controlled from a ground station, um, just like, you know, most all other unmanned systems. So there is a pilot or we call them the remote control operator that sits on the ground and he or she is piloting the aircraft. And when we're ready to land, um, depending on what mission we're doing, this bottom left picture kind of gives you a feel for how we do that. So we go from you know, flying in a straight and level orientation, kind of just like it shows here in the middle. And we firstly, we initiate recovery is what we call it. And that we have a drone chute that comes out, which is this smaller parachute. And that smaller parachute basically takes it from level flight to a nose down position. And it's going to basically go straight towards the ground, nose down. And the drogue is going to kind of get it under control in that configuration, slow it down a little bit until we get it down to the altitude where we want to deploy the main parachutes. And then three main parachutes come out. You can kind of see that. It all comes out of the top of the aircraft. And when that happens, then the plane goes into a level orientation. So it goes horizontal to the ground. And a short time after that, we have two small airbags that come out at the very bottom. You can barely see them in this picture. And those airbags basically arrest or help soften the landing when we do get to the ground. So the idea is really anywhere you have a flat, you know, flatter, flat ground, um, you could land this plane. It doesn't need to be anywhere near an airport necessarily. Um, so that's, that has a lot of advantages for different mission scenarios. And then to even take it one step further, you know, kind of the shipping concept of what this has looked like is it's almost like, you know, drone in a box, right? So you you have this trailer that the vehicle sits on, you take the wings off and the tails off, you can put everything in there, you have all your tools, everything you need, you can literally pull it out of the trailer, put the wings on and and go. So it's not near the same level of involvement of maybe prepping a, a, a manned plane or something like that. And next, we're trying to talk a little about what it does. So as far as performance is concerned, it's a pretty cool airplane. Um, you know, for people who, if you think about, you know, maybe what a Southwest flight does, you know, you go um, cross country, something like that. It's kind of the longest you're going to fly. This plane was designed with a mission radius in mind of 1,500 nautical miles, so which comes out to, you know, a max endurance of greater than 10 hours. That's a long time, right, without, without refueling, without doing anything else. In addition to that, um, you know, having to go very fast, so a dash speed of Mach 0.86, and be able to do 6G maneuvers, um, you know, that's that's pretty pretty crazy. The the mission radius here that I mentioned before, 1500, that's with two SDBs, so those are small diameter bombs in the weapons bay. If you don't have those, right, then it says the mission radius here is greater than 3,000 nautical miles, so that extends it quite a bit. We do have multiple areas in the plane as well where you can hold. Um, different kinds of payloads. And a lot of the work we're doing right now is around, you know, we have this plane and we're now putting new sensors and technologies on it to try to do other cool missions. So if you look kind of up front here in this top left picture, um, there's multiple bays where we can put payloads, you know, about 400 pounds worth. We also have an area down here in the weapons bay that can have a lot more, right? So about 1,200 pounds. And then if you wanted, you can also put payloads on the wings, either, you know, close here near near the body of the plane or out on the wing tip, and you can have a decent amount of payloads there. So the, the idea is this is kind of like plug and play, right? So if somebody comes to us and says, hey, we want to be able to put a bunch of cameras all over the plane and take pictures of this, you know, sure, we can go do that if they want to do something else with something in the weapons bay, that's possible. But there's a lot of options, and it's very... You know, we kind of like to think about it as a modular vehicle. If somebody comes in and has a certain need, we're able to find a place to fit them and provide them the power they need and can kind of go from there. The only other thing that 
is important to kind of point out is this last, this third bullet here on this page is kind of a big deal. We'll talk about it in a couple couple slides is that the Valkyrie or the XQ58A is a concept that is meant to really operate in conjunction with or in concert with manned aircraft. So sure, it can go do its own mission um, and that, that's great. You can do numerous things with it on its own, but there's also very much a de desire to have you know, these planes be kind of like wingman for manned aircraft that are in the air. So let's say you have one fighter jet in the air, you might have two to four to six of these drones out in front, you know, doing surveillance or other kinds of operations. So you're providing not only situational awareness for the people, the actual manned people, you know, in the aircraft behind, but maybe you're also providing some protections and things like that. So it's a really cool concept that it seems, it seems futuristic, right? That we'd have drones and manned aircraft flying next to each other, but that future is becoming closer and closer as we develop these systems that are more robust and more reliable and, and better tested. I have a video I'd like to share what I'm done. I'm going to skip it for now because I don't want to mess up my, my sharing, but I do want to pull up. There's a launch video that you can watch that's pretty cool from one of our um, operations that we did a couple months ago. So one of the key things I know that you know a lot of these talks are very much space focused, but one you know when I was asked to to participate in this, I was excited to do so, and I'm coming from a from a space background. You know, I did the space side of things in senior design, and I was very much interested in human space flight. You know, always wanted to be an astronaut, those kinds of things. I wasn't sure how I was going to like the aircraft side, especially you know unmanned aircraft side of things when I started working on it. But I've I've found. Um, that there are a lot of similarities, right, in the problems that we're solving on both sides of the fence, both the space flight and the aircraft side of things, whether it's manned or unmanned. And um, there's some things that I've noticed just in the last 10 years of being in the industry that I think are important for everyone to understand, but especially young people that are coming into the workforce in any way. Uh, some takeaways that I kind of hope that you guys can see, and, and I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but is that you know there's lots of different ways and creative solutions to a lot of the problems we're facing right now whether it's on the aircraft or the spacecraft side this slide is totally you know my thoughts has nothing to do with kratos but when i think back about the kinds of programs that were a part of the industry you know in the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and even earlier than that you know in different around the different world wars a lot of the advancements we made were because there was a war going on, unfortunately, and something was needed, or there were just big budgets because we had just had a war or we were going to have a war. And, you know, it was kind of like, we have a problem, we have to fix it. And they would throw as much money at it as they could. Um, that's not the case anymore. Um, you know, it has changed a lot and it has forced not just private companies, but the government and the, the government entities that manage a lot of these operations to be more creative, to be more lean, spend money more, you know, wisely and enable rapid technology development. And that's a really big piece of it because right now, you know, technology is developing so quickly that when you get a project on January of a year, you know, by December of that year, it's already out of date by a lot, right? So if we take 10 years to develop the next big thing, that thing's gonna be so old by the time it's done that no one's gonna want it. And so I think it's important to kind of highlight that in both realms, there are ways that we've kind of changed, you know, how we're doing business. And there's some examples here that I'm sure, you know, anyone who kind of follows the news and aerospace news would be aware of, but things like, you know, the, the commercial space flight, um, the crew, the commercial crew program on the space flight side of things, you know, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, SpaceX, Blue Origin, companies that were competing for NASA contracts. And, and therefore, you know, there was a down select process and they had to do their best to try to you know, win those, um, win those awards. Same thing with the cargo program. Um, you know, once the shuttle program ended, they needed someone, uh, you know, carriers to bring things up to the space station because that was still operating. And so they've had multiple private companies that have, have enabled them to do that at a lower cost. Um, also lower cost, small and mid-size cargo access to lower earth orbit. So smaller rockets, not the, not the huge, you know, ordeal that is a shuttle launch. Um, but something a little bit smaller. Um, a lot of people think of, you know, maybe CubeSats or things like that, but there's all kinds of sizes of, of things that we're sending into space now, um, you know, low cost satellite stuff. And then the last two bullets kind of talk about what I, the realm I'm in now, which is expanding how we're using unmanned systems. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the news, we're using, you know, drones, quadcopter things or slightly bigger ones to do 
surveys over land to do safety monitoring over, you know, oil and refineries and factories. Um, there's just a lot more, a lot more in the aerospace world now than ever before because the technology, you know, has expanded and and people have kind of thought creatively of how they can use solutions for multiple different applications. Uh, and so in my mind, you know, what my big takeaway from all of it, kind of learning what I have over the last few years working on these kinds of systems is that there is not a, you know, a one size fits all. And more and more the world is showing us that that's not true. And we need to continue to find creative ways to um, you know, solve problems. So continue to be creative, use what you learn in all areas of your life and academia to try to formulate these solutions. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, if I'm not studying a STEM field, uh, I can never be involved in this kind of stuff. And and that's really not true. You know, if something interests you, find a way to participate. Um, there's a lot of times where, you know, engineers will get stuck on a problem and they would never see an obvious or or maybe a creative solution to something because that's just not within their their realm or, or you know, their headspace. So I think that's important. What we've done with the Valkyrie aircraft is, is pretty unique. Um, there's a couple other companies trying to kind of enter that world now, but, you know, they're kind of behind the curve. And so I think that not just in that arena, but in, in spaceflight and aircraft manned and unmanned, there's a lot of room for creativity because simply, you know, the government um, isn't going to shell out, you know, the billions and billions and billions of dollars like they may be used to, uh, to different programs. So it's important to be lean, to, to work smart, right? Not hard and um, just continue to grow and learn as a company and make sure your engineers and the staff that's working on those things is doing so as well. So I think what I'm gonna do, um, this is kind of my last slide. I do have a slide in here. If you're interested in learning more about the XQ58 a plane, there's a bunch of links and I'm happy to share these in some way. So you can read more about what the plane is and what we're doing. I'm gonna see if I can get the video to play here real quick. You see a plane? <laughs> okay. Okay, so this was a little video they put together. We did a we did a flight in January that basically was we were carrying a payload that was providing communication between um, an F-35 and an F-16. So it was a pretty cool payload we were carrying on board our drone and we were flying alongside manned airplanes, which is kind of the long-term goal and proving out this concept that it would work. Now they put this whole presentation together to kind of talk through what the program was, but I'm just going to kind of show you some quick sections here that give you an idea of the CONOP of our vehicle. So this is the unmanned plane about to take off. This is our control room. That's me in blue there. Our pilot's over on the right. Kind of gives you a feel for the operations and here is the launch. So it is quick, it is fast, the rocket motors fall away. And then this is a, a view of us flying. So the drone is in the front there, the XQ-58A, and then you've got the, sorry, the F-35 and the F-22 next to our plane. And you can kind of see that out the view of the other plane. It kind of gives you a feel. There's, there's some other footage in here, but it's mostly just of our operations. I'm happy to share this link as well if people want to watch it a little more. This was a really big deal just because of all that participation that we had from the F-35 and F-22 teams. Um, we're flying up with a drone is not a normal thing, especially that close um, because of, you know, being a newer drone, it's a scary thing to fly next to. So um, it went really well. We had no issues, um, but it's a pretty cool video if you guys want to check that out as well. Thank you so much, Samantha McHugh. If anyone has questions, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Um, you may also submit questions in the chat. One of our hosts for the talk will read your question. Also complete the short poll at this time. It should pop up on your screen. Samantha, I did have a question. This is Heidi from the University of Illinois. I noticed for the ship, shipping of it, is it, it's, you can ship the drones just in a regular shipping container? <laughs> you can, yeah. And when we ship them, to the test ranges and stuff, we just put them on the back of a flatbed truck and it's covered. So I always laugh that, um, you know, anytime you're driving down the highway and you see a covered truck, you never know what's inside. <laughs> um, and it, it's really that simple. Well, yeah, because I was looking at your diagrams and noticed that it fit and it looked like a standard shipping container, which is interesting. because um, Yes, I, I just yeah, it is. That and saves cost. It just is. A, it's a cost issue. Exactly. Yep. So to do special transport and stuff like that, it adds a lot to the, you know, to the operations. And so a, a sh standard shipping container that can go on a truck or a boat or anything is, is kind of what they want. 
Um, hi, my name is Danielle. Um, I'm from NIU. So I know you mentioned that the like they can be controlled from the ground, like through remotes. But what if like is there a chance that like it could somehow mal like malfunction? And is there like a safety mechanism that would like land it properly? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so we call that LOC. So that can, that can mean loss of comms or loss of carrier. Um, and that does happen. Um, and that's actually a, a, a common scenario for drones that if for some reason it loses its link with the ground, it usually has kind of a routine that it does on its own. Um, and it will fly, uh, you know, in most cases, it'll fly some kind of orbit pattern and trying to regain the link so it can continue its mission. And if for some reason it doesn't or it can't regain that link, then it does an, an automated sequence to get itself back on the ground. So that is definitely an important piece of the safety element of this plane um, because we, of course, don't want drones flying around with no one controlling them. So sometimes we fly with multiple data links if it's critical that we keep control the whole time. So maybe you'll have two or three different radio systems on the plane. But a lot of times we just fly with one. And if we need to use that safety feature, then we do. Um, and we actually tested that out in our last flight completely uh, and purposely, um, you know, lost, you know, got the link to come down so we could test all that out and it worked great. So we absolutely do that. Hello, I have a question. My name is Courtney I'm from Northern Illinois University. I have a question about like, how did your experience like working at NASA and even UTC Aerospace and Simron help you with this, this mission of the XQ-58A? Because I know that's NASA is more like, I guess, out of orbit. Um, this would be more like in orbit. So I just want a little bit of details mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, my experiences at NASA and, and all the different varieties of that, whether, you know, no matter what company I was working for, what helped me the most was that, you know, NASA is constantly working on big problems and they're dealing with really big systems that have multiple elements. And, you know, those kinds of complex systems don't just exist at NASA. Um, you know, they exist in a lot of places. And for example, the, this plane that I'm working on now is a, is a pretty complex system that has multiple elements, you know, there's a ground element, there's a launch element, there's a the actual flight itself, very similar to just like a, a you know, you want to call it a commercial crew um, uh, a space flight issue, right? They have, to, they have to be able to handle things on the ground, they have to be able to launch from the ground, fly, return to earth and, and recover. So all those phases of the mission, they're, they're obviously different, <laughs> but we have to think about the same things and learn how to solve problems in a similar way. So I think, you know, learning how to be a really good kind of overall uh, system thinker and think about the big picture and how each piece plays a puzzle of the whole was one of the major things that I learned from NASA and those experiences and brought to my current job. And I think it's, it's helped me a lot with what I'm doing now. Okay, thank you.